and quarter the computer. Got it. Mm. So great to be with you, um, William Bloom. Um, uh, and you'll be known to many of uh, my, my viewers and readers uh, and your work on, on spin your spiritual companionship and your writing and your blog as well. Um, and we're talking just about, I, I read a newsletter of yours where you talked about um, some of how, about how the pandemic has been playing out in, in Glastonbury in particular, but also in wellness and spirituality uh, in general. And it's something I'm uh, been watching myself and I'm very interested in. Um, so I'm just, I'm up the road in, in Bristol and I've, I've heard a little bit about what's happening in Glastonbury, yeah. um, but I'd love to hear more. Could you, can you tell me just a bit about what, what it's been like and what's, what's, what it's been like to be there for the, during the pandemic? Yeah, that, that is an interesting question and um, makes me slightly squirm um, uh -huh. because it's, um, it's also a bit, it's also a tad embarrassing because it's, it, it's not just Glastonbury, it's um, all the way through the um, spirituality, not religious, new agey, holistic approach to spirituality, which, which I've been um, deeply involved with since um, starting meditating and mind tripping 50 years ago. Um, and the whole load of what I would kind of term my people have um, become very um, strident vaccine skeptics. Um, I understand it at one level. Um, I remember years ago with my children, I was vaccine cautious because of all the stories that were going around and um, kind of careful to look at the evidence and tr trust the mother's instinct as well. But um, what's happened during lockdown and during this COVID crisis is that the, and you must have noticed this as well, is that, is that the um, debate between the two sides is not a comfortable, relaxed conversation. It's mm. full of charge, emotional charge, full of um, aggression, full of passive aggression, full of um, hostility. Um, so in Glastonbury, for example, <clears throat> I know several folk who were good friends, but because they stand on different sides of the vaccine debate, mm -hmm. they, they have literally stopped becoming friends because the moment they meet, mm -hmm. there's a, 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 a fury a vehemence, mm. a, a, a kind of nastiness that actually mm. comes into the conversation. And mm. I've, I've encountered this myself. I, was, I think of one guy in particular who um, I used to hug. And uh, early on in the pandemic, um, he, he's big and he's young and I'm old, not so wonderfully fit. I'm okay. And he wanted to come up to me and hug. And I, I said, no, just give me some space. And he immediately switched into this <clears throat> deeply hostile, angry, angry vibe, which didn't just hit me in terms of words, but also as a vibe that kind of shook me. And I was, um, actually, I felt, um, I felt bruised for a, for a couple of days. So it's very intense. And mm. um, is it all right if I just keep talking a little bit longer about it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. no, I'm fascinated. Yeah, so the... Um, so another example is that um, the Whole Foods store, there's a very big Whole Foods store in Glastonbury High Street. It used to be the Woolworths. At one point it was Woolies and <clears throat> Woolies went broke and the, the organic store moved into it. And it's a, it's a nice place to hang out. You meet friends and it's got good stock. But what's happened over the last year and a half is that many of us are now going in there very cautiously because it's filled with um, women and men, usually in kind of um, quite flamboyant hippie clothes, um, kind of clothes I actually associate with um, 
Mallorca and Ibiza in the summer for holiday makers, you know, the kind of weekend hippie clothes, but they're now being worn permanently, right? And they're young and they're quite vital and they're not wearing masks and they have this attitude of um, defiance and slight entitlement. And what bothers me the most about it is not that they, they should think that way and decide to act that way, but that they are completely ignoring the fact that older people and medically vulnerable people are threatened and frightened. Mm -hmm. And their behavior, they're, they're not wearing the mask, they're kind of slightly flamboyant not wearing it, is actually yeah. frightening to vulnerable people. Right. So I've had conversations with friends of mine who've been vaccine, vaccine skeptics, and I've, you know, I've said to them, look, I totally accept your skepticism, but when you wear a mask when you go into a shop, because you frighten old people, you know, mm. you frighten vulnerable people. And some of them have um, understood that and gone, okay, understand, citizenship, good neighbours, that, that makes absolute sense. But others have seen it as a, that I've joined the um, conspiracy Jewish cabal lizards who are seeking to control the planet and uh, i can just f off with that uh, idea uh -huh. it's been very it's been very intense and very extreme yeah and um i saw in the news sometimes like um there have been scuffles in glastonbury around uh, around masks and mask wearing um i've not witnessed them but um Jeremy Corbyn's brother, Piers Corbyn, um, is a vehement vaccine skeptic and in his own way a climate denier and in his own way, though he won't recognise it, an anti-Semite. Um, he comes down to Glastonbury and there's a crowd of um, kind of extreme libertarians who also believe in um, a certain type of English nationalism that kind of dates back several centuries that predates the enclosures of when, uh -huh. kind when of British yeomen were free to wander the lands. Folk nationalism. Yeah, folk nationalism mixed with a strange mix of uh, com communitarianism, socialism with a, a patriotism that's almost fascist. And... Um, which is one of the strangest things about the culture wars at the moment is you've got fascists and lefties joining together in their anti-vax um, thinking. Sure. And fascists but, and hippies. Yeah, fascists and hippies. And it's been really, it's really, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, I, I feel a tad squirmy and embarrassed because those are, those were my people. You know, I am their father. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. part of the generation before them. Yeah. And, um, anyway, so I, I know that Piers Corbyn created a couple of events where the police had to come in and try to enforce mask wearing. Um, and Piers Corbyn's an eccentric creature yeah. in himself. Oh. I mean, he was busted recently taking a bribe, what was it? set up in a, in a comedy sting by a couple of YouTubers, uh -huh. taking what he thought was 10,000 pounds to go easy on the AstraZeneca vaccine and focus on the other ones. And they uh, they actually switched the money, so it was just monopoly money. But that's how principled he is, apparently. I, I really shouldn't smile on hearing that, but I'm. Oh, it's yeah. So, I'm, I'm, it's... So, I mean, my, my wife and I, Sabrina and I, went to one of his talks in the town hall. I was actually in the first place more interested in. I was I was more interested in his brother, and, and I was trying to understand Jezza Corp, Jeremy Corbyn. I'm a Labour Party member and trying to understand mm. Jeremy and, and thought if I saw his brother, I'd get a sense <laughs> of the family constellation, you know, and what was going on there. And I, I, I came away very dismayed. Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds like, a, you know, what I thought of as this um, peaceful hippie town is, is a bit at war and a bit like the picture behind you. There's this, uh, there's this division uh, going between it has it been like that um I, I it's not been talked about like that and it doesn't feel like that on on the streets the, the, only, the only place it feels like that is in the whole food store 
<laughs> it's um, no because the land the landscape and the mythology and the sense of place here is much stronger than a than that particular argument but mm -hmm. um you know i don't know whether you have any um experience of intentional communities or or alternative mm -hmm. communities but the, the the politics the cultural politics the group building the you know, identity securing mechanisms are always um difficult and charged um mm. and and Glast glastonbury also has a challenge with um, loads and loads of travelers are uh, parked in vehicles around um, the island i call it the isle of avalon around the island and and i, yeah. I quite actually i like your interpretation of my painting that the um mm. <laughs> the river is a dividing <laughs> as opposed to a lovely pathway to the tour. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's quite, is quite... it true that there are there have been shops with signs saying, you know, do not wear a mask in here? I never noticed them. Um, mm. I can believe that. There's one kind of anarchy, anarchy shop in the high street that might have it, but I've, I've not noticed it. And you said that um, some of your friends um won't even wear a mask because they think that's part of um a conspiracy have you come across that i mean i've i've written about kind of the overlap between new age and, and conspiracy thinking have you come across that then in the last 12 months yes um i was reading um an article the other day i can't reference it which described a kind of general psychological pattern which was that three people would perceive the slightest infringement upon their personal liberty that that for them it's a thin end of a wedge which quickly opens up to a sense of um, overbearing control which they need to um, liberate themselves from and defend themselves from and um, within within that worldview wearing a, a mask is seen as a um, an act of collusion with the oppressors right and, um, i mean moving to another kind of community going, going up to the fintorn foundation in scotland where i was very recently okay um, fintorn yeah i which for your listeners who don't know it, it's the leading eco-spiritual education community center in europe wonderful right. wonderful place wonderful yeah. atmosphere incredible um, model of permaculture gardening uh, ecological building but in there they have a similar debate amongst their workers and i know that in a day-long kind of strategy meeting of the whole community of their workers the first two hours was spent on mask wearing you know, that that was the topic of discussion and um, mm. those who were shrewd and anti-mask wearing had got a doctor's note to say to excuse them from wearing it and they had a little you know you can wear a little tab up which which says you know medical reasons i don't wear it which is related to asthma or claustrophobia yeah. right or, or just saying you feel phobic when you put it on um, mm. which i'm sympathetic to because i hate wearing them i don't know about you uh, yeah no sure and i went to a a retreat center um uh start of this year and we were all wearing masks of course it's completely different going to a retreat when one's all when one's wearing masks it's it's it takes away a lot from it however you know you, the whole point of an intentional community is to look out for one another isn't it yeah so what did they what did they resolve? How did this play out? It this? didn't resolve. Right. So yeah. there's there well, there was this on pass. Yeah, it's an ongoing. Well, the the thing is that the two sides, the the vaccine skeptics, and the vaccine advocates, yeah, are pretty glued in, psychologically glued into their stances. Um, right. When you asked whether I wanted to have this conversation with you, I, I kind of leapt, leapt at the opportunity to yes, yes, because I'm writing about it at the moment. And I, you know, yeah. if you'd seen me an hour ago, I'm, I'm <laughs> writing a blog about why these people are so glued in, psychologically glued in yeah. to their particular stances. And at core, people are 
unconsciously driven by a set of internal uh, dynamics that take it to a, a survival question. You know, they, they, it's, it's an unconscious dynamic, but the opposing view threatens or is experienced, perceived, cognized as threatening their survival. Yeah. And so when you have the two people having that conversation, one, it's, it's not a pretty sight. And I've had it's to say to a couple of yeah. friends, yeah, I've had to actually stop them dead and say, look, I'm not having this conversation with you unless we can revert to just being having a friendly vibe. Yeah. Yeah. And they've gone, you know, they've been slightly shocked. I, I said, I, you know, we're friends, but, you know, yeah. we have different opinions. Let's have a conversation about it. Because um, both sides see the other side as, as, as a mortal threat as, and as an existential threat. And I can understand how the unvaccinated do pose a kind of potential mortal threat to, you know, the people who are at risk. And they're a threat to the, the ability to open up the economy. But um, for the anti-vaxxers, the, the vaccinated, are, they see them as a mortal threat as well. Uh, and, and, and that's because, I mean, explain that to me. That's because they're, a th like you said, like a threat to a way of life, a threat to liberty, part of a kind of totalitarian plot. I've been pondering this for ever, ever since it started, because I have people close to me who think and feel that way. And I've kind of got three levels of interpretation um, and all of which might be wrong mm. and all of which might be applied to the pro vaxxers but, mm. but the three levels of motive of, of what's going on unconsciously is, is yes, they perceive anybody else telling them what to do. Don't tell me what to do. It's a thin end of a wedge, and, and they're, it's a charged issue for them if they're told what to do. In general, in their lives, don't tell me what to do. And why are they so sensitive? Why are they on such a short fuse? And why do they look at those who are taking vaccinations and going, you're just sheep? like going into Auschwitz, you're just a little sheep and doing what you're told to do. So I'm looking at early years trauma that then becomes highly sensitive to anybody else behaving in a way towards one that triggers memories of the abuse or neglect or whatever it was. I'm looking at that at a very kind of mainstream psychodynamic level. I go into another level as well sometimes, which is a kind of Jungian archetypal level, that there is a, an archetypal, a, a collective uh, state which is fascistic and totalitarian, controlling, and people are, are rightfully frightened of it and reactive to it especially mm -hmm. if they've had experience of it before and it's hurt them. Mm -hmm. But it's always the thing that they've had experience of it in a small form and it's hurt them. And, and the third one is um, much more Asian shamanic spirituality. It's a past life thing where I go, it, it, it's, it's logical to me that if there is such a thing as reincarnation, if there is such a thing as past lives and people carry resonances of those memories, then there'll be millions of people who have experienced totalitarian regimes, mm. Mm. who've experienced war situations and extermination and all kinds of horrible stuff. And when they see this in this new life, when they feel, touch, see the slightest bit of control, it's interpreted as being what they experienced yeah. historically yeah. and they react furiously against mm. it. But I, it, even yeah. if these perspectives aren't right, mm -hmm. even if my theories are completely um, wrong mm. minimally they help me frame the vaccine mm. skeptics in a way that keeps my heart open yeah yeah rather than just these are uh, um homicidally selfish because because they they you're right that they genuinely do think that they're, they're 
they're doing the right thing. They're doing yeah. a good thing. They're not just being selfish. And I suppose also it would be easy to feel threatened at the moment as countries put up barriers to the non-vaccinated, because who knows how it'll play out. Like right now, it seems like the vaccines might not even be sufficient because of mutations and so on. But it does look now like countries are saying, if you're in companies are saying, if you're not vaccinated, you might not be able to fly um, this or that, you know. So I can imagine feeling, gosh, my life options are shrinking because of my choice not to have a health treatment, you know. So I can imagine feeling threatened and cornered a bit by, you know, heavy handed government. But I want to ask you, um, you know, and I, I feel the same, exactly the same as you, um, that, you know, you talked about the sense of embarrassment about my people, exactly what I felt since, you know, April of last year. What, what am I, what's my culture doing? What are my people doing? Um, um, so why do you think, what are the cultural reasons? Are there cultural reasons as well? There's maybe the personal, the psychological reasons, psychodynamic. Are there cultural reasons why spiritual culture, spiritual but not religious culture, um, should be particularly prone to, to to things like anti-vaccine um, sentiment? I ponder that and I can't see any clear threads that give me any kind of illumination about it. You know, you know there's, some there's some obvious stuff about um, uh, an, uh, an anarchic, deconstruction of patriarchy and and how religions box you in and how right. the new so spirituality that kind of libertarian aspect all, all that stuff I, I, I can see that but yeah i'm i'm at the forefront of that personally you know i i'm a, a, a almost a professional mystic slash iconoclast that is right. almost how i've made my living for the last yeah. 30, 40 years. Um, and I don't feel that myself yeah. at all about the vaccine stuff. And I'm very, I'm sure just like you, I'm sure I'm very sussed about mm. big farm and capitalism yeah. and all just all of the possible implications. And I'm very aware of how mm. totalitarian nations, especially China at the moment, yeah, and Turkey can manipulate yeah. the events in order to manipulate their peoples. I'm very sussed about that, I, I think. Um, yeah. But, as my friends on the other side would say, I'm just completely fooled. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think um, you, could, you could imagine a reality where you became anti-vax? Yes. Right, I can imagine that about myself as well. I, can I mean, like, I tick certain boxes, yeah. you know? I'm into wellness, I'm into alternative health. I'm, yeah. I'm, like you, suspicious of power, state power. I'm probably like being, having alternative contrarian opinions. Yeah. So I can kind of imagine it. Yeah. But, the, but the big difference is where we acquire our information from. Now, the, all the folk I know who are, who are vaccine skeptics, the ones I know and who are vehement vaccine skeptics, prior to COVID and lockdown, they had already stopped reading mainstream newspapers. They'd stopped watching television news. Now, four or five years ago, the kind of things they were saying to me were, I, that stuff brings me down. I don't want any more bad news. I don't need to know. I don't need to wake up and know what's going on in the world. I'm just. I'm just not going to get now. But that that lack of um, seeking out new knowledge um, translated with COVID into not. I don't like it, it, but it's all false. So where would they get things well, from? Well, you know as well as I do, worse, worse than that is they've been getting it from social networks. Now, yeah. I'm a, a, a Cassandra type in relation to social networks because well, I'm starting maybe six, seven years ago, and I'm an early adopter of tech. I like mm -hmm. tech and I like the web. But six, seven years ago, I started saying, 
the nature of the algorithms inside Facebook, and I use the word evil, are mm. evil because they aggregate information and guide people into collectives of mutually sustaining, reassuring belief. And I said, I want those algorithms to at least have a 15% opening to contrary views. So they get some, but the people I know, if, if I ask them what their sources are, their sources without exception um, are mainly Facebook and are mainly a few homegrown news websites purporting to be scientific. Mm. Um, they have a view, which is great, mm. but my friends are not reading the other perspectives, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, and it's, that's very distressing. And, and I've, I remember one in particular, I had to reassure her that there were MPs in Westminster who were shouting noisily about the incursion on personal liberty, right? Mm -hmm. And she, 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 she shouldn't believe it. What did she think was going on? No, she didn't know, but whatever it was, it was only what the BBC or Daily Mail or the Times were saying, and they were all part of the conspiracy. Right. And right. I had to reassure, I said, look, I'm just reassuring you, you're not the only people, they're folk in Westminster. Right. <laughs> it's a hot, it's a hot topic. Right. Um, right. And so um, kind of extreme paranoia. Oh, I haven't used the word paranoia. Um, you're much well, more I mean, down conspiracy on Conspiracy theory. Your, your, your language is much more down on them than I am. Maybe, maybe I see too many of them to dare use that <laughs> language. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you think it's all an, a plot, then that's paranoid, yeah. isn't it? Well, it's either, it's either paranoid or it's realistic. Or awakened, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. It, it's very, it's that, that's, that's the precise challenge. And yeah. what I well, want... It's, it's, it's your degree of paranoia, isn't it? Yes, I, I think paranoia is, is that the right word? Possibly. I, that's, that's one way of framing conspiracy mm. theorists. I think I think it's a tad too harsh because the moment it comes out of your mouth, you're you're destroying any bridges that you might build in order to have a conversation with them, mm. with someone. Mm. Well, who, sure, sure, sure. You know, maybe you're, right, you're sure. talking. You're talking to someone who agrees with you here. Uh, yeah. So. No, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I like, I'm, I'm enjoying watching you pause on that one. Going, <laughs> well, I was, I was remembering someone language. saying to me once, you know, why are you so paranoid or something? And I said, I felt like, who's been saying that about me? <laughs> you know, it's like, it is an alienating word. Yeah. But um, you, you have been in, in, in this culture for a long time. You, you, were you really surprised? I mean, you must have seen a tendency to things like anti-science or anti-mainstream science, um, to unusual beliefs, to conspiracy theories previously, no? Is it? Yeah. Um, I'm not surprised by where my culture has gone. I, I, I've watched it do crazy things in the past. I remember it, it went um, it went bananas over the millennium bug. Do you, do you remember the millennium bug? The millennium I, bug was I going do. to crash. Right. It, was going it to went crash. apocalyptic. It was just, yeah, it was, yeah, it was going to be apocalyptic. And, I'm, and people I knew who had money um, in the States were buying wood cabins up in the mountains and stashing <laughs> them with food and stuff, right? And then it went so, bananas in, was it 2012? Well, yeah, there was the harmonic convergence. It went bananas. Yeah. It, I mean, the, 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 Norman Cohn, the, the cultural historian, wrote a book called The In Pursuit of the Millennium, which yeah. had a huge effect on me when I read it 40 years ago. But just describes so decade by decade, there's one, there's always a group of millennialist uh, nutters who think the world is about yeah. to end and go right. bananas. And I've, so I've watched my culture do that. Um, it can be wonderfully, profoundly naive. I'm, I'm at the, the greatest piece of naivete I ever saw in my culture was we used to run the program at St. James's Church, Piccadilly. And, um, Alternatives. Yeah. And um, my, 
we had a feng shui expert in once who t told people that it, in order to feel more powerful and more empowered all they needed to do was put some tin foil on their shoulders like like generals epaulettes right <laughs> and uh, there were all these people wandering around London the next week or so with little bits of tin foil. Uh, well, why not just put a hat on as well? Well, absolutely. <laughs> with lots of stars, right? And, uh, Excellent. But um, that naivete is usually grounded in um, they're good citizens, usually. They look after their neighbours. They're, they're instinctively caring folk. You know, so there's an interesting balance there. So, so, I, I, so I wasn't... I, I'm not surprised by where our culture has gone, and I'm pretty sure that in two or three years, when this dies down, when when this current plague has subsided, yeah, it it will all melt away. This the, 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 it will melt away, and we'll, they'll not be embarrassed or think about it in the same way people, as the people will come down from the mountain. Yes, they'll just, they'll just move on to something else. They'll forget about it. So I, th I think that will pass. The bit the bit. The, the two things that do concern me, one I've already kind of asserted with a kind of whinge, which is Facebook's algorithms and Twitter's algorithms. I, th I think they're offensive to any evolutionary culture. I think they absolutely need to be adjusted. And I think that's a matter of ethics and morality and not, um, and it's going, they're, they're ethics and morality and they don't, Zuckerberg and co, they don't quite see that yet. They don't, they, don't, they don't take responsibility for, yeah. <clears throat> for the, the, the media that they've created. I think that's hugely important. I think there's going to be a needs to be an important clash there. And there are some people who are, who are on the side of the angels and some who aren't. But I don't think politicians yet. I think Tony Blair was right in his last great epistle about the policies the Labour Party should adopt i think he was right in suggesting the labor party needs to get on top of the digital world and develop intelligent ethical policies to do with that future which is what's avalanching towards us um and i know people don't like him but that was a good thread in his mm. proposal and the other thing that shocked me um is the culture wars the 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 strange debates and, and ugly, angry debates in the trans discussions. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm confused by them. I'm confused that having a penis is no longer a designate of gender. Mm. That, that confuses me. You've got a penis. Yeah, no. You know, that seems to me a biological given. But even to, even to say what I've just said, I know is offensive. To yeah. folk who are seeking um, to affirm and assign their own gender and identity. And that, that, that confuses me. And what confuses me is the, um, um, the ugliness of yeah. the debates and the cancel culture stuff. You know? I, I, I agree. If I may, I, I'd like to just ask you a bit more about the kind of, particularly about spirituality, because because we're, we're broadening into things that are, that are definitely also driving the issues within this culture, but I'm particularly interested in, in, in our culture. Um, first of all, I, I, I wonder if you were surprised also by, by this alliance but the, the, this, which struck up uh, in the last year, or was obvious, um, between the far right and um, hippies. Um, is that something you've seen before? Um, is it something you saw in the last 12 months, particularly like, did you see people saying, oh, well, Trump's so great, or even, oh, Putin's so great? Um, because I, I saw that a bit with some kind of new age hippies talking about Trump and Putin as the kind of light worker messiahs. And, um, and just on that topic, finally, um, did you ever see kind of like you know, anti-Semitism in, in, in new age circles? Yeah. Those are very big questions for me. Um, I come from Jewish heritage and yeah. um, I'm 65% Ashkenazi Jew. Okay. And um, that's not been an issue for me. Uh, it was a little bit in my late teens and early twenties. And there was, there was both some anti-Semitism I experienced and also some advantages 
from being having a Jewish surname. In the last five years, for the first time in my life, I have become aware of my Jewishness and anti-Semitism and all the dynamics that go with that and the um, ignorant thinking surrounding uh, the history of Jews, the history of Israel, the history of Palestine, just, just ignorant. And um, it's difficult for me because I, I did my first degree in international politics and my doctorate was in identity politics on a global scale. And I know all the factors, for instance, on to do with Palestine and Israel and that it's not yeah. just Israel. And people, people forget there are tunnels between Palestine and Egypt, you know, uh, completely forget about that, for example. Mm. So the sloganeering that emerges out of the left wing and out of conspiracy folk, that is very casual in its comments about rich Jews or Jewish way of thinking. And there was a, um, four, four or five years ago, there was a um, one of the conferences in Glastonbury in the town hall, there was a crop, crop circle, and one of the conferences, and yeah. somebody on the panel started to make comments about Jewish money, Israeli, just, just the usual beginnings of this anti-Semitic tropes. And I remember in that moment, I thought, yeah. am I going to stand up and, sh and shout at them? Am I going to walk out, sit? What am I going to do? And I, I very noisily stood up. I, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit known in the town and that culture. I stood up and I walked out. Um, in, a, in, a, in a talk about crop circles. It, it, it was to what your crop circles, but it, does, but it doesn't surprise me actually. Yeah, yes, yeah. because and one conspiracy often merges into another, and and now there can be some line between the Rothschilds and crop circles, as ridiculous as that sounds. Well, the, 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 yeah, and the line is um, that Israel is is the creation of a capitalist Jewish capitalist, blah de blah, and Not. Palestine is representative of the oppressed masses of the planet that whole yeah oh it's a, it's an archetypal thing and it's clumsy and it's and it's difficult and i did for the first time start to go okay i need to keep my eyes open now and notice what the risk is and we had arguments at home actually in my house where mm -hmm. i started to become um a little bit more sensitive and short fused than i had previously been mm -hmm on things to do with Israel and uh, Jewishness. So, yeah. and have I been surprised by it? Uh, you know, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, essentially, I'm probably like you, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a med, I'm a meditator and a mystic. You know, by mystic, I mean that, <laughs> I'm flattered. <laughs> I'm right. flattered that you share me, share yeah. me and your, your your experience. Well, I'm sure every, a lot of people listening are part part of mm. that crew. You know, by, by yeah. mystic, I mean that. You know, I, ha I have had experiences in my life to do with altered states of consciousness and the yeah. beauty and wonder of the universe, and I think that's a lot more interesting than anything mm -hmm. human beings are doing, actually. <laughs> And you know, it's the long term, you know, things are going to change over thousands of millions of years. Mm. So, yes, I'm stepping back from the anti-Semitic tropes and going, all right, I wasn't expecting that in my life, but there they are happening. That's just the way it is. Mm. Can I hold my center? Do I need to be active in any way to push it back? Um, I was always an activist. So when I was a teacher or working in a community college and I there was any uh, sexism or racism, I would stop classes there and then and point mm -hmm. it out and mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. it very quickly and immediately. Um, right. So I'm reflective about it. You know, I don't know. I mean, human beings are capable of anything, aren't they? If <laughs> <laughs> 
and yeah. the right triggers. But, but back to your question, which I know you want me to stay focused on. Mm -hmm. um, no, I wasn't surprised, actually, because mm. human beings remain human beings, don't they? And mm. um, they, we have these swerves in our cultural mm. evolution, don't we? And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. What, um, what do you, as a, um, do you mind if I call you an elder of the community? <laughs> yeah, I do. I do, because I think, I think eldership is rubbish. Okay. As I, I, think, a, I, think it, I think it's the way it's insecure old people put on the clothing of yeah, dignity yeah, 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 and pomposity yeah. in order to maintain some ah, Okay. All right. Scrap that. <laughs> what do you, as part of the community, yeah. um, think we can do about it to um, keep it in, in, you know, in better health? Do about what? Um, some of the issues that have, that have just arisen over the last... 18 months. I suppose I, I'm thinking in particular of the um, hostility to mainstream science, the kind of antisocial behavior you were talking about, like, you know, people in the Whole Foods, the conspiracy theories. I, I suppose a deeper question is, how do we heal as a culture? Because at the moment, like you say, we are quite... Um, polarized into factions i have a very clear strategy for myself um, which is number one i have to take responsibility for myself and that means that in all my relationships and the way i am in relationship with this kind of news in the very first place, I need to stay in my center and in my heart. If, if I come out of my center and if I come out of my heart, I start to collude with the problem. I start to circulate energy with the problem. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not of any use. I'm not of any use at all. So it's like a martial artist has to, has to remain centered and mm. earthed and grounded and in horror in order to be able to fight effectively. I need to be deeply grounded and present. That's the first thing. Mm. And, and I experience in many situations, one-to-one -one in groups, that if I can stay in that role, authentically in that role, because some people go into that role kind of passive aggressively <laughs> and slightly patronizingly, uh, if I can stay in that role with a big warm heart that I'm still loving people and compassionate to their state, that in itself creates a space for conversation. That said, I also need to be prepared to be courageous. And if I experience what I interpret as abuse, either overt or implicit, mm. either physical or, or structural within the culture of the situation, I need to do something. I need mm. to say something. At the very least, I need to express mm. my uh, opposition to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if I, if I can keep my behavior in those two realms, yeah. Um, and be very patient because I think it will pass. Yeah. But I, but I don't want to collude with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. Have you seen other people, have you been struck um, by other people in the culture? I don't know, st standing up for the values that you support uh, in this, you know, uh, 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 over this time. Like, you know, like I, I don't want to say taking a stand, but like, um, um speaking up for the pro-sociality of getting a vaccine say or um or speaking against conspiracy theories i think it's very difficult um because we're in a moment of um conflict and the fire is hot mm. and so for example i have tempered my public 
statements and my blogs because I don't want to attract the level of abuse yeah. that, I, that I know it would attract. Mm. Um, I, d I don't want to handle it. I'm not, I'm not sure. So I, I'm not sure I could handle it healthily. I think, it, yeah. I think it would. I think it would overwhelm me. Right. And I ponder whether I'm being cowardly. Um, I'm not cowardly with people face to face, but in terms of writing, I, like I didn't. I didn't post. I've had my two jabs. I didn't post that because <laughs> it would be dangerous to do. In yes, it would, it would because there's so many folk in the culture that would that would go for me. I know that. Bloody hell! Isn't that sad? Yeah, it's sad. And if I hold my center and my heart open, I go in a crisis where people are frightened and hysterical and triggered. It's naive of me to expect rational behavior. I However. Think However, I, I, most, yeah. I, I cool. will step in if I see abuse. But I think in most parts of the UK, in most bits of British culture, um, did you say, how old did you say you were? I'm 72. Uh, if it's, you know, a 72 year old can post, I, I just got vaccinated without getting publicly attacked. But in spiritual culture, it's, it's a risk. You're going to get kind of online hate mobbed. Well, you go, that's the nature of social networking and, and the people who are sitting in their homes, uh, this, this is their job, this is their passion. This is yes, their... but I mean, I think it says something about this culture as well. Yes, it's, 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 it's um, fragile. It's fragile. It's, it's, I mean, I spell out what it says about our culture. That you, what do you think it says about this culture? Well, I think it's 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 gone a bit crazy, um, and and it's not the only one. Like I think, for example, in the U.S., white evangelical churches have really, really got fired up and extremely not just vaccine hesitant, but really vaccine resistant and really mask resistant, and you know, have also been very fallen prey to conspiracy theories like like QAnon and it's so there, there are kind of parallels between that and it's just strange to me because spiritual culture thinks of itself as not fundamentalist as you know science and spirituality in a marriage as kind of critical thinking but also open to the ecstatic and um and it's and it you know it's 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 gone very black and white in its thinking whereby a 72-year-old might get, you know, um, mobbed online for just saying, not, not everyone must get vaccinated, but I got vaccinated. Um, so, and I suppose, what does that say? Maybe that says spiritual culture is sometimes prone to the kind of mythical thinking uh, or apocalyptic thinking that, um, that, uh, sometimes religious people are as well so like we're, we're like that I guess um, I think you might be on something about early trauma as well and yeah how that can make people both prone to spirituality unusual beliefs but also like black and white thinking and dividing people into saviors or enemies or demons um yeah there's also a, a herd mentality yeah. at work there as well yeah they're, they're finding they find a lot of reassurance by being with a group of peers that share yeah. Yeah. their yeah. feelings and their thoughts and their dynamics and you know if, if if you're what if you're watching a herd of buffalo gallop towards you yeah oh not pleasant <laughs> get out of the way absolutely yeah. absolutely but i mean yeah I like your point. Yeah, I, I I think though, I I've I've reached a point of realism. I think. I mean, and it it's not been sudden. Thirty forty years ago, when spiritual not religious was 
beginning to break through fully, quite often under the new age rubric. Mm -hmm. um, people like me were consciously thinking that as well as dismantling patriarchy, it was dismantling <clears throat> certain aspects of materialism. And there was a purity to the movement and most of the people in it came out of the caring professions in one way or another or were, were aligned with them. And then cap capitalist forces, commercial forces gradually started appropriating um, like that like world music, you know, right. world religion, the, 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 the smorgasbord got appropriated by commercial forces uh -huh. and it became commercialized. And so at, at St. James's, for example, I could put on an evening about, about ecology and get 50 people or put on an evening of poetry and get like 12 people. But if I put on an evening of how to make money and get sex in five easy steps. You know, you'd have a thousand folk in the audience. Uh -huh. <laughs> <And> <laughs> how to organize a spiritual event. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was, you know, it, it, it was like publishing. You get, get a few bums on seats for big events and then you can pay for the other folk. But um, so you're talking about like kind of law of attraction stuff. Well, yes, all, all I'm saying is that, or, or selling yogi nut stones off Gwyneth Paltrow's website. The, the, whole, mm. the whole thing that I was involved in and helping to break through became just a lifestyle commodity. And yet in the culture, there was, you know, it's like an iceberg, you know, there's, there's a small percentage of us or maybe not so small, who retain an element of reflective thinking, idealism, a, 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 an aspiration for purity and honesty and all the rest of it. And then the, the mass of folk that followed us, I just suddenly went, oh, this is just like any other religion. You know, you've got a few good people leading it and mobilizing it and in its cohorts. And then you've got well, just, just folk mm. who want to improve their lives and be happier and all the, all the rest of it. So when you say yeah. the, the similarities between spiritual, not religious and right-wing evangelical Christianity in the States, it's a similar phenomenon, you know? Yeah, yeah. And you get bad actors. And, Absolutely. And, and, and wolves. Yeah, yeah. So that's so did been... You, yeah. Did you run alternatives with Malcolm Stern then? We started it, yeah. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you about that? Uh, and I, and I, I we'll, we'll, we'll end in five minutes. I've taken up lots of your time, but just, just briefly on alternatives. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated in that because I, I love the history of this culture, and I, I'm, I, I guess I'm a historian of ideas, uh, and so I like just uh, hearing about the history of, of, of and, and I know that alternatives is, is an important part of the history of uh, spiritual culture in Britain. So, um, can you who can, I mean, who are the best and the worst uh, experiences that you had in alternatives? Oh, really? <laughs> oh that's nice. <laughs> all right. Uh, who did I like the best? Okay. Yeah, the best. Who did I, and, and, who did and who I was, like? Who was the worst? Who because I, I, I'm fascinated by organizers in this world because they yeah. see behind the curtains. Yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, um, oh, you want the gossip, don't you? That's the gossip yeah. of who I like. All right. Um, of the big names, I loved Thich Nhat Han. I loved him, and I especially loved him because um, after one of his talks, we were backstage, green room, and some Vietnamese refugees came into the space, including a couple of children, and he just immediately went down on his knees to be at the same level as the children. And before he left, he, he looked at me to see how I was and he said, everything okay? And I said, I would just, I would love a hug. And which is kind of a cheeky thing to say to this venerable creature. And he gave me a hug and it was like being enveloped by a, just the most gorgeous butterfly. It was just like absolutely 
absolutely beautiful. So I, so I loved him a lot. And there was um, oh. a Jesuit um, Buddhist who I liked a lot as well. Um, I liked him a lot. So and and it was what was what was interesting, and there were people who were big names, who. I were, were great communicators, fantastic right. communicators, but speedy creatures off stage. Deep, Deepak Chopra, speedy creature off stage. Sogyal Rinpoche, great speaker off stage, a complete rascal, you know. And um, <laughs> I, I, I never went backstage when they were talking. I always sat with the in the church because I like to feel whether or not something transformational happened. So sometimes you'd have somebody unknown just giving a talk to maybe 40 people and you could feel that people were being moved and shifted by the talk. Mm -hmm. And there were other times where you had these very famous speakers who came in and did something hugely entertaining, but nothing enlightening or transformational would happen. Right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I mm -hmm. loved it and I was very grateful to be there. I can imagine. Did, did you so? I mean, you preserved your um, idealism. You didn't. It didn't make you jaded. Kind of. I don't know. Um, seeing what venerable no. spiritual teachers can be like close up. No, I'm. I'm not naive. Um, like you, I've. I've. I've, I've done a lot of mind altering substances. Um, <laughs> And I, you know, started in my teens, and um, I was also a motorbiker, motorcyclist, oh. and a biker. And I, I rode with some very heavy people, and I failed my A levels. And I never didn't go to uni until I was thirty. You know, so I, I have a history. <laughs> I'm not, not, not. I'm not naive, and I have a little bit of street wisdom about me. Right. Mm. Uh, so I'm, people don't surprise me in that way. You know. Right. Uh, so you didn't have a totally kind of rosy hippie view of humanity. No. You recognise that there's some ugly stuff in there. No, no, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I did three years psychoanalysis when I was 22, twi twice wow. a week. Um, wow. So I am, and my dad was a shrink, and I was a teenage criminal, and or, you know, so I. I I'm deeply aware of people's foibles and neuroses and mm. how, how they are in reality. So, so I, when I said earlier, faced with conflict in the culture wars or the vaccine discussions, it, my job is to stay centered and in my heart and hold what's going on. Yeah, I'm, I'm not talking from some fluffy romantic space. I'm talking from that's the only place to be for conflict resolution. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant. Yes, Thank yes. you, William. Yeah. Okay, last question on spiritual emergencies. Yeah. Um, because we share this interest in it and, and you've done work in it with on you know spiritual companionship. Um as interest in psychedelics seems to grow and they're going more mainstream, um, how concerned are you about? The potential fallout from that if um oh, are you frozen I um okay. oh there we go okay great um how concerned are you about the potential fallout from that about as psychedelics go mainstream if thousands tens of thousands maybe even millions of people are having psychedelic experiences um mystical experiences and perhaps um, without the support or the training to um, integrate these experiences? Um, just to on, on, on my website, there's a free 40 page PDF about spiritual emergency, which gives all my best hints on Great. how to manage it and think about it. If you go to, it's down the bottom of my home page. I'll put it, I'll put it as a link. Yeah, and it's free. Um, you know, the, there's a friend of mine once described um, psilocybin and mushrooms 
as avatars from the plant realm, not just as medicine, but, but as useful, friendly gurus that emerge out of the plant realm to help people shift their consciousness. Yeah. So dealt with in a way that's careful and thoughtful and dignified and planned, I think they have their place in the development of consciousness and spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, I think what people don't understand is that the brain and nervous system in spiritual experiences open up to the, a flood of energy, like electricity that's in the cosmos. And if that flood of energy is too sudden or too overwhelming, then the brain and nervous system get overstimulated and go into hyperdrive. The electrochemistry of the brain goes into complete um, shock and does all kinds of weird things. So I, I, I would want people trained a little bit more in an understanding of the energetics of mm. spiritual emergency. Um, I'm mm. not worried about it on a mass scale because you say, you talk about it as if, as if it's something new, but you know, there are millions of folk took acid in the mm. 60s and there were millions of folk took MDMA ecstasy in the 80s and 90s, you yeah. know? Mm. And um, so some part of me goes, I wish there'd been more spiritual emergencies. You know, I, I should, and that's a terrible thing to say, but I wish there'd been more spiritual awakenings yeah. out, out yeah. of those mm. drug-induced experiences. Um, I, I mm. would like to kind of, everybody hear me when I say, I shouldn't have made that joke. It was totally no, yeah, yeah, yeah. especially for people who've had a, a very distressing emergency. But, um, but actually, the, complete lack of awakening is also... Yeah. No ideal. Yeah, but there's, there's another side to the coin, which is there's, 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 I think, huge numbers of people in the mental health system who are in actual fact recovering from spiritual awakening, but the mental health care system hasn't recognized what's actually going on. So That's there's really this education that needs to happen there as well. Really interesting. Hmm. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's, I really enjoyed talking to you. Has there mm -hmm. anything that um, I, I haven't asked you that you want you, you feel moved to bring up or, or, or raise or add to what you know to what we can talk about in general? I, I, I think I would I just want to, I would want to remind folk that when they're experiencing a culture war or confrontation with and they notice within themselves that feeling, those feelings of arousal and anger and conflict, that that is the pr precise moment to practice mindfulness and centering and calming down and coming into your heart and holding space, you know, unless there's abuse going on, in which case intervene. But if it's just, yeah. if it's just an argument, just a debate, if one of you can do that, if just one person can do that, it, it can ripple through the group. It's, painful to do it because you have to put the, you have to put the brakes on your own momentum yeah. you know yeah um so, yeah that's true and so and that's partly about staying friends with people even when you've got fundamental disagreements like over brexit or um vaccines these kinds of things like it's, uh yeah. it's stay good humored good humored you know if, if anything's going I, I don't, I don't mean jokey-jokey. I just mean stay good, good humoured. Stay good humoured. It all will be well. Yeah. All will be well. And, 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 and like, there's a risk of identity fusion, isn't it? You take, if that's your stance on this issue, that's all of you. And I, I, I can't accept any of you. Rather yeah. than, I like most of you, this bit I disagree with, but the rest of you I still like. Yeah, but, but it's lovely for people to go as friends go, oh, we disagree about that. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Let's have another conversation about later on and see if we can develop. I mean, that's isn't isn't I mean in philosophy, you're a philosopher, aren't you? I mean, the dialectic of contrarian views building to some new synthesis is precisely what good conversation is about, you know. Mm, yeah. One of my favorite books is called Wit Wittgenstein's Poker. Do you know oh, Wittgenstein's right. Poker? It's about the debate. <laughs> Cop yeah. Karl Popper and Wittgenstein met in a Cambridge senior common room and they started to have an argument. 
and Wittgenstein picked up a poker to make his point. And the whole book is about, was he genuinely threatening with his poker or was he just making a point, you know? Yes, yes, very good. Well, I hope no one uh, picks up a poker in response to this conversation. And I really appreciate your kind of nuance and open heartedness. Um, so, you know, thank you very much, William. Great to, great to talk to you and get, great to connect with you. Yeah. Wish you peace and happiness and all good things. Likewise. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'll...